Welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. As we follow Jesus together, we experience the Holy Spirit, create a multicultural community, and pursue kingdom of God justice. Well, happy Easter, friends. Good to see you guys today. How are you doing? Good. You guys got like three extra hours of sleep from the first service, so you should be feeling great, right? You got like six more cups of coffee. You're doing good, right? Not jittery at all. My name's Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're really happy that you're here with us this Easter. You know, for the women at the tomb that day, if Jesus was alive, it meant that he was actually the Messiah. It meant that the hope that they had placed in him wasn't wasted, that everything that they had lived through in the previous years actually was worth it. For the women at the tomb that day, the resurrection made everything matter. Everything counts. But if the resurrection never happens, then everything else is pretty meaningless, right? I was talking to a friend who I've known for about 15 years about his journey with alcoholism and mental health. And uh, he was laying out in more detail than I might have heard before uh, what had gone on in his life. And he was telling me about a little over a decade ago how he started uh, just really struggling with some mental health stuff. And so he started drinking more heavily to try and cope. And it the drinking grew and grew and grew. And then it started affecting his moods and he started getting angrier when he was drinking. Uh, And then it started affecting his wallet because alcohol all the time costs money. Uh, You can figure that one out. So that created some extra stressors. And then it started affecting his work because he would leave work a little early to go to the bar to get a drink before he would go back home which then affected his family and his marriage because he was drinking so much uh, and trying to cover it up in lots of different ways. And it was like this death spiral that was going on in his life. And he just felt powerless to be able to get out of it. And he was saying that about five to six years ago, he started to realize that there was a problem. Uh, He was a little later to the game than maybe his wife was (laughs) with that uh, reality. But he realized that there was an issue, and so he started getting help. So he went and got some help for uh, the mental health things that, were, that he was struggling with, and then he started getting support for his addiction. And he said that he went to celebrate recovery uh, to, to get some support uh, for his addiction. And I asked him, I was like, just curious, like, why celebrate recovery versus Alcoholics Anonymous? Like, just because you're a Christian, you, it was at your church, like, what was the reason for it? And he said that it was because in Celebrate Recovery, they have the 12 steps of AA, but they also have eight principles that are based off of the Beatitudes from Matthew. And they line those up with the 12 steps. And he said he went to this like uh, kind of experience evening for it. And they talked about these eight principles and the first one grabbed a hold of him. And it's this, realize that I'm not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. And it's partnered with the first beatitude, happy are those who know that they are spiritually poor. I admit that I am powerless. He already felt powerless. He tried. He had tried to control it, but he knew he wasn't doing it on his own. He needed something else. And maybe, just maybe, where he was powerless, Jesus would be powerful. The good news is is that I'm talking to him. He's five years sober because Jesus was powerful where he was powerless. If Jesus is dead, then it's all meaningless. But if he's alive, It changes everything. You know, we often separate the Easter story from the rest of the Gospels because we want to save that for uh, for today, right? You know, so we're like, we don't need to read that. We read that every April, March, somewhere around in that. Like we separate it out. It's like the special thing that we talk about. But if we separate the Easter story from the rest of the Gospels, we get this really awkward like story that just feels a little bit weird. You know, a dead man coming out of a tomb, it feels like, 
It's, it's disjointed, disconnected, a little maybe disembodied. Uh, it, it feels a little too good to be true. It's like this thing that like we have to make happen to make the story flow. Uh, it feels kind of like a fairy tale, a happy ending. But if we connect it to the story, the entire story of Jesus, then it all starts to make sense. Because the resurrection wasn't extra. It wasn't a nice thing that happened at the end. It was everything. It's necessary. It was the thing that made everything else relevant and real. It was the act that proved that Jesus was who he actually said that he was. It was the action that began to change our world and maybe a few of our lives at the same time in ways that couldn't be changed again. It was irreversible because the resurrection proved that Jesus had power over everything in our world. And that's what makes it good news. Romans 8, what Sarah read at the beginning says this, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. How does that change everything? How does that change us? Because the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And he did it simply for you because he loves us. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come. And same power that raised Jesus from the dead is here among us. It's the whole message of the gospel. And so Jesus, I just pray that you will come and transform us, renew us, restore us, bring us freedom, bring us life. Thank you that you live and that that changes it all. And so we just lean into that truth this morning that a resurrected Jesus is here among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let me ask you, what's the difference between good advice and good news? You ever thought about that? Let, let me throw it out here a different way. Who goes to Dunkin' more than three times a week? Raise your hand. There's no shame in this. Okay, I see, I see Caleb. Who else? Who else? There's, got, there's at least one other person here who goes to Dunkin' more than one time. Who, who do we got over here? Oh, Herman. Okay, and, uh, okay, Stephen, you got to come down here. You know, I'll make you come down. Um, and, uh, and Caleb, come on up. So I'm, I'm going to make you guys come forward because I have some good advice and some good news. You know, good advice. Oh, you guys are like promoing right here. Look at that. You got your cups. Um, please, please hold it up to the camera. <laughs> right, right. There we go. Thank you. Appreciate that. Nice work. Nice work. Right. I know the lights are, they're a little bright. Uh, what's your drink? What do you get at? Extra large hot French vanilla swirl, eight whole milk, eight sugar, and eight front pumps of French vanilla. <laughs> Stirred very well. I thought I could repeat that. I actually can't. But well, that that deserves a handshake. That's an impressive drink right there. It's every week, every day. Every, every day. Three times a day. Wow. 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 I have some good advice for you. <laughs> yeah, diabetes. Is a <laughs> I know. I've heard of it. And, you should just brew your coffee at home. I do. Yeah. It'll save you so much money. Oh, believe me, my grandma makes coffee every day. <laughs> but that, I mean, I don't know actually with all the things you put in if you could save that much money. But hypothetically, that's what it says, is that you could. So you should start, you should start doing that. Does that make you feel good? I do it at home, and then I bop, stop at Dunkin' uh, Dunkin' the way in. So you're twitchy is what I'm yeah, hearing yeah, a little yeah. bit. A little I'm twitchy. I'm a certified mechanic. I have to be attentive. <laughs> You can't be twitchy as a mechanic. That's like yes, a surgeon saying they're twitchy. Like, yeah. It makes me nervous. <laughs> what do you get, Steven? Uh, usually I get a colada, different flavors. Okay. I'm so, not a coffee drinker, so. So you get whipped cream and flavor and ice. Yes. 
Really? Okay, okay, I have good news for you. There you go. Your Duncan is on me this week. Enjoy it. How do you feel about that? No advice attached to it, just enjoy. There you go, you get it too. There you go. Thank you guys, thanks. There is a difference between advice and news, right? You grab a hold of it. That was an impressive drink. I don't even know what to say about that. That was, that was pretty good. Tim Keller writes about this. He says, advice is counsel about what you must do. News is a report about what has already been done. Advice urges you to make something happen but news urges you to recognize something that has already happened and to respond to it. Advice says that it's all up to you to act. News says that someone else has acted. Good advice has the potential to make you more informed. Yay! Good news has the potential to change you, to transform you. And so when Mark begins the first account of Jesus ever written, Mark 1, 1, he says, this is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Some translations say that this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, instead of saying good news. Because in the Greek, gospel equals good news. They're the same word, they're interchangeable. Most theologians agree that in our kind of like English linguistic reality, that news is a super weak word for this because I don't know about you, but when I think about news, it's either like NPR or 24 hour news or uh, some dude in a fancy sports coat sitting at six o'clock telling me what happened with the Red Sox that day. Like it's not the most exciting thing. And they throw something out there that may feel a little bit like shocking, you know, watch this police chase. But like for the most part, it's pretty boring and mundane stuff. That's what I think of when I think of news. But this word that's used here in the Bible is the word evangelion. And it actually, it, it's attached in a way that uh, is special, that's unique, that's kind of extra. Uh, it was far less common. And it was always treated with importance because it was always something that was said from Caesar. So it was like an imperial thing that went out to everybody that affected their life when this word was used. It was more like an announcement or a proclamation from Caesar. So the Greek word evangelion equals gospel, which equals good news. And gospel, as you probably know, is what we call the first four books of the New Testament. It's the stories of Jesus' life and ministry and his teachings and what happens uh, to him, which means that Jesus' life equals good news. And good news has the power to change you. In the Bible, the gospel isn't simply just a way to get saved and go to heaven. That's not what it is. The good news tells us what God has already done and how that impacts us, affects us today. In Matthew 28, the angel's at the tomb and he says something as if it's actually good news. He says, don't be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified but he isn't here. He's risen from the dead just as he said would happen. If Jesus is dead, it's all meaningless. But if he's alive, you know, in the first century, the Greeks didn't believe uh, that a body would go with you to the afterlife. They believed that your soul left your body and that you had this empty husk that kind of decomposed into the ground uh, and ended up disappearing, Uh, which may sound a little familiar because that is where much of our cultural thinking about what happens after we die comes from. And and so the Jewish folks, so during that time, didn't believe that there was individual resurrection. They believed that everybody all at once at the very end would be resurrected when God came and brought everybody with him. And some Jewish folks didn't believe in a resurrection at all. But what no one had any framework for looking at resurrection as being one guy in his body rising up from the dead that was completely outside of any cultural or religious expectation in their time at all. 
Now, unfortunately, the church, and I throw fingers at myself on this too, but we have treated the resurrection as simply good advice for a long time. We've made it into this thing, and we go up to people, we're like, do you know where you're going when you die? Eternity's a long time to be wrong, isn't it? Like, like that's gonna really grab a hold of you and change you forever. Uh, like, that's how we've gone about it. And so we've looked at salvation as, as kind of something that's obsessively focused on what happens after we die. And then we start to ask questions. Like, we say, you know, what's it like when we get there? What, like, what's the houses like? Am I gonna be bored? Nice golf courses? Good food? Do I have options for food? Do I cook or does God cook? Like, what are, what, what are we talking about here? Uh, which, which way am I getting my, uh, my steak? Uh, is it gonna be good? Do I have steak? Is that allowed? Is that kosher? I don't know what's allowed up there. And then we start to analyze it a little bit. And then we start saying like, well, what if I go to the other place? Is, like, what's it like? Is it, is it really that bad? Or what if I go to the other place and then I'm like, I'd really like to go back up. Is there an elevator? Can I work my way up? Can I make it to, to heaven after I die? Like we start analyzing and it's basically like we're comparing Costco versus BJ's. And we're like, which membership has the most perks for me? Which one's gonna give me the most things after I die? But Jesus never did that. That's never how he talked about eternity or salvation. In fact, when some of the religious leaders came up to him, they tried to trip him up and they asked him about resurrection and he completely avoids what they're going at altogether. And so they come up to him and they're like, yes, Jesus, I have a very serious question for you. This is a good one. So there's a woman married to a man, congratulations, uh, and the husband dies, but he has seven brothers. According to tradition, he, the, the woman then marries the next oldest brother, and then he dies. And then he, she marries the next, and on and on and on, until she's married all seven or eight brothers. And then she dies afterwards. Who's she married to when she gets to heaven? And this is only a slight paraphrase. It's pretty much exactly what Jesus says, though. So. He looks at them and he goes, have you guys ever read the Bible? Like, that's not what it says at all. That's not what it's talking about at all. Have you ever read what it actually says? God's the God of the living, not of the dead. God's not obsessed with death. He's obsessed with life. That's what Jesus wanted to tell us about. Because the good news of Jesus' resurrection for the disciples was not that they were gonna be able to get to heaven when they died. It was that Jesus was changing their world right then and there and that he had the power to do it. It was about proving that Jesus was actually God. Remember what the angel said at the tomb. He said, he is risen from the dead just as he said would happen. And he did say it a lot of times in uh, the Gospels to his followers. You can read all of those if you would like to. I'm not going to right now, but Mark 10 says this. Listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him with a whip and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. If we prioritize where we're going when we die, our here and now may end up feeling a little bit pointless, a little bit extra. But the news of the resurrection means that our now matters deeply to Jesus. N.T. Wright wrote that the resurrection means that what you do in the present is not wasted. It will be completed, have its fulfillment in God's future. But you might be sitting there and you're like, but how? How does one guy coming out of a grave affect me 2,000 years later? How does this actually impact my life? And T. Wright again says that it's by the Spirit, the Spirit who dwelt in Jesus so richly, the Spirit already present within Jesus' followers, the guarantee of what is to come, is not only the beginning of the future life, even in the present, but also the power through which the final transformation will take place. 
the Spirit is not only the beginning of what's to come, but here in the present. The Spirit which is given to us through the resurrection of Jesus changes us, fills us, empowers us, renews us, restores us today. Again, Romans 8, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. You know, we're starting a series today that's called Empower that is all about how this resurrection power enters our life and changes us for now. So I want to just encourage you, join us April through May and spend time digging in and figuring out how this changes our lives today. And you might even be changed a little bit by it. You know, I heard a story about a father and his daughter and the, the dad got home and uh, his daughter came up to him and she said, like, Dad, can we make a fire in the fireplace? And he said, sure, let's do it. So they went and they gathered wood and they started to stack it and then they put paper in there and, you know, everything was perfect. It was all in the spots that it should be. And then uh, the dad took a match and he lit the paper, started to, to flame up. And the daughter knew exactly, because you know, three or four year olds know exactly how to build fires. And so she knew exactly what was needed. So she got down on her knees and she goes to that fire and she goes, <gasps> but she does it a lot more wet with like slobber coming out. You know how three or four year olds blow. And so it's like, I'll, I'll save you, Lisa. You're welcome. I won't do it to you. But like, it's like slobbery and like spit globs going onto the wood and onto the flame. And she keeps blowing. And then somehow, miraculously, the wood actually catches on fire. And she jumps up and she's like, Dad, I did it. And he's like, yes, you did. Yes, you did. What his daughter didn't really realize is that the whole time that she was blowing her spit globs, her dad had gotten down with her. And he had aimed exactly at the spot that needed to be lit. And when she took a deep breath in, he took a deep breath in. And when she blew, he blew, but he actually blew in the right spot with a lot less water. <laughs> and his oxygen, his breath, was able to help the fire to actually light. That's what the Holy Spirit does in us. He takes our spitballs <laughs> and allows them to be uh, powerful enough to turn into flame. He takes our weaknesses. He takes our little offerings of conversation with our lonely neighbors and allows us to be able to say something to them that actually shows them love in a way that impacts them deeply in the moment. He takes our uh, scared prayers for our coworker when they just found out that they were sick and we say, oh, can I pray for you? And we pray and he actually does something in their life. He takes our little offering and he takes his power and adds to it and things begin to happen. That's what the Holy Spirit does. I don't know what it's like to see an empty tomb on Easter Sunday, but I know what it's like to wonder as you're walking to the tomb if it's gonna be if he's going to still be there dead. I know what it's like to doubt whether or not he actually is powerful enough. Because if the resurrection never happens, then all of it's pretty meaningless. But here's the good news. Jesus is alive. The resurrection of Jesus isn't the bow on top of the gift. It's not the icing on top of the cake. It's not extra. It's everything. It's the thing that makes it all come together. It's the thing that makes it all work because the resurrection means that Jesus is God and that he has power over everything and that he is using that power to bring transformation to our lives and to our world in shattering ways. So let me ask you guys, what do you feel powerless against this morning? Do you want some good advice? Or do you want good news? 
Because if Jesus had the power to rise from the dead, then he has the power to bring you freedom over fear, over anxiety, over anger, over bitterness, over addiction, over loneliness, over depression. If Jesus has the power to rise from the dead, then he has the power to restore your marriage in ways you could never do on your own. If he has the power to rise from the dead, then he has the power to come and heal your body right here and right now, to heal the body of somebody you love who is struggling and feels out of control. If he has the power to rise from the dead, then he has the power to give you meaning in your life. And so you no longer have to ask, is it actually worth it? If he has the power to rise from the dead, then there's no end to what he could do. Why would a disconnected, absentee, passive God go through the crucifixion? Why would a disconnected, passive God Father to rise from the dead. He wouldn't. And that's the good news because he's not passive. He's not disconnected and he loves you deeply. Mm-hmm.